God, um, I just come before you with uh, all humility and just, God, I just give you the glory for anything uh, good that happens today and anything good that comes from when I speak. God, I just ask that you would uh, just focus my thoughts and my heart and uh, help me to speak clearly to the people here at Glen Cairn. Amen. Um, so just a quick update. Uh, we had Ava, Ava Victoria Snyder, our daughter, two weeks ago. She was 12 days late, um, and but everything was great. We had her at a home with midwives. Susie's great. She's great. Um, but we're adjusting to life with two, two little ones, as you pro most of you probably know. And if you don't, hopefully you do someday. Um, so that's... Uh, that's where we're at in life right now. As far as Bosnia goes, the last time I was here, I shared uh, that we needed to raise some support to get back there in August. We haven't been able to do that, so we won't be going back on August 2nd. Um, we still need $1,100 a month uh, to be able to go back. So if you'd like to be part of our team financially and help us, come and talk to me after. Uh, we're meeting with our boss at the end of this week to discuss when uh, we'll push that date back to. So that's what's happening with us very briefly. Um, Bosnia is still there, the team is still there, and they're still doing work there. Um, and God is still faithful and still moving. Um, so, let me get to the important part, and that's God's word. Um, today, I'd like to try to communicate two things to you, and I hope that when I'm finished, you'll be convinced that they're true, but also, I hope that we, it will awaken inside all of us a desire to act on the truth that I'm trying to communicate to you today. And so the first thing I want to communicate is that every Christian has been given a gift by God and is responsible to use it for the good of others and the glory of God. And the second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go into Scripture and hopefully give you five compelling reasons as to why you should act on the previous statement I just made. So the first thing, every Christian, so if you're a Christian, this is you, every Christian has been given a unique gift by God and is responsible to use it for the good of others and the glory of God. But how do we know this statement is a true statement? And I believe we can learn the truth of this statement through two ways. One is experience and the other one is through scripture, the word of God. And so what do I mean by experience? And what I mean by experience is just life. As we live life and as we observe life, it doesn't take too long to figure out that each of us is unique and each of us is different. And so if we believe that God created the world and sustains the world, then it's a safe thing to say that we owe that uniqueness to God who is the creator and sustainer of life. And if we believe that, then we certainly have a responsibility to God to thank and honor him in the way that we use that uniqueness that he has gifted us with through his grace. And I think that if all of those statements are true, as we attempt to use them in the proper way, we'll realize that the only way to do that, the right way, is by edifying each other with them, by serving each other with them. There is no other way to properly use the gift that God has given you except to edify the people around you to bring glory to Him. And so experience teaches us that we're all uniquely gifted, that we owe this gift to God and that we have a responsibility, we're obligated to use that gift to glorify God and for the good of others or to edify others. But it's important that our interpretations of experience are always confirmed by our interpretations of Scripture. And I'm going to say that again. Our interpretations of experience should always be confirmed by our interpretations of Scripture. If you don't do that, that's where you can start going like this, from God, I believe. And so there's two passages 
that I want to look at that I believe really confirm um, what experience teaches us. And so the first one is 1 Peter 4, verses 10 and 11. As each one has received a special gift, employed in serving one another as good stewards to the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So right away in these the two verses, we see everything that experience teaches us. Number one, in the first line, each of us has received a gift from God. Number two, we have a responsibility to use that gift to glorify God. Number three, we have a responsibility to use it for the good of others. And the fourth thing that it shows us, and this is what I don't want us to miss, this is the practical implication for all of us that this verse shows us. And that is, if you are a Christian, there is some special manifestation of God's manifold grace in you which can be used for others to help them in life and faith and can honor God. I want to say that again. If you are a Christian, there is some ma manifestation, a special manifestation of God's manifold grace within you which can help others in life and in faith and can honor God. So let's look at the second verse that I think um, will help us, and that's 1 Corinthians 12, 7. And it says, But to each one is given a man the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Now notice here it says, To each one is given. It doesn't say, to pastors and to missionaries and to perfect people is given, it says, to each one. That means to everyone. There's no exceptions. Everyone is given a manifestation of the manifold grace of God for the common good. So, if you are a Christian, then you have been given a unique gift by God and you are responsible not to squander his grace through negligence. Let me say that again. If you are a Christian, you have been given a unique gift by God, and you are responsible not to squander that gift, the gift of his grace, through negligence. So I hope you're getting the theme of what I'm trying to say today at this point. Um, so as we see these two verses clearly line up with what experience teaches us, that we're all different, but that we owe that difference to God and we're obligated to do something about it. God will hold us to account with how we use the things that he's given us, the gifts that he's given us. We can't be negligent with them. And so that brings me to the second thing that I'd like to do today, and that is to try to look at scripture and give <laughs> some incentives, for lack of a better word, as to why you should use those gifts. If that wasn't enough, if the first part wasn't enough, then hopefully this gets you there. There's many more incentives than five, but I'm going to pick five today. Um, and I'm gonna, my five are found in 2 Corinthians 3 and 4. So if you can turn there, that's where we're pretty much going to camp out um, for the rest of the time. So the first incentive as to why you should use your gift the gift that God has given you, the gifts that we owe him, the uniqueness that we owe him, is that as Christians who use the gifts of God are ministers of the new covenant. And that might sound odd, but hopefully I can explain it. So let's look at um, 2 Corinthians 3, verses 4 and 6, 4 to 6. Such confidence we have through Christ towards God not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. <laughs> the old covenant was an agreement between God's people, God and his people at Mount Sinai. The new covenant is an agreement between God and 
and his people that if they trust and obey Jesus Christ, he will give them eternal life. Now these two covenants aren't that different, except that the spiritual power to overcome the hardness of man's heart, hearts was by and large not given in the old covenant. And what that means is that in the old covenant, the word of God was for the most part pursued without a reliance on the spirit. But in the new covenant, the spirit writes the law or God's word on our hearts and our minds through faith and it ceases to become a deadly external constraint. It ceases to kill anymore, like Paul says. Instead, what it becomes is a cheerful expression of our own will and purpose. So as God writes it on our hearts, it becomes our own will, and we think we're choosing to do good things, but it's God who's doing, us, doing it through us. Um, and so, if we're under this covenant, if this is the new covenant, if God has wrote those things in our hearts through faith. What is the incentive to use our gift? How does that relate to our gifts? Um, and I believe that it's simply this. When you use your gifts, you get to become a part of the work of the Spirit of this age. And I want you to think about what that means for a second. When we use our gifts, we become part of the work of the Spirit of this age. So when we read the Bible and Paul is doing his work He's part of the work of the Spirit of that age. And we're reading about it. When we use our gifts now, we become part of the work of the Spirit of this age. That's an amazing thing to be allowed to be part of. That's an amazing thing that God has trusted us with. Because we get our gift from the Spirit, and we use our gift by the power of the Spirit, it means that the fruit it produces is a life lived in unison with the Spirit. So not only are we a part of the spirit of this age, as ministers of the new covenant, we're part of what it's doing, but we are now living our life the way God designed us to be. What a great thing. Not only do we get to be partakers of what God is doing in this age, but now we're living in unison with the spirit because we're doing exactly what God has created us to do. That's a pretty good incentive, I think. But that's not enough for us today. I think I'm going to give you another one. Just in case it's not enough. The second one is that the use of our gift is what Jesus meant by servanthood. And servanthood is the path to greatness in the kingdom of God. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 4, 5. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as, as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. So when Paul uses his gift here, the gift of apostleship, when he's preaching, something happens. What happens is that the people get the service, and Jesus gets the glory. So what is the incentive to use your gift if you don't get anything out of it? The people get the service, and Jesus gets the glory. Let's look at Mark 10, 43. It says... But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. True greatness in God's kingdom is servanthood. And the use of your gift for the good of others is the way that God intends you to serve. I don't believe that you can serve effectively any other way than to do it the way God created you to do it, than to use the gifts that he gave you, and then to allow his spirit to work through you to use those gifts. That's the true way you can serve effectively. And when you do that, that is the path to greatness in the kingdom of God. So, not only do we get to be partakers in what the spirit is doing now in this age, live a life in unison with the spirit, but now we get to become great in the kingdom of God. If we use our gifts, the gifts that God has uniquely gifted us with. Now, the third thing is less of an incentive and more of a... I couldn't think of a word today or this week when I was preparing it, but it's basically, I hope it takes away any excuse not to use your gifts. Um, 
The third incentive to use your gifts is that your ordinariness is no reason not to use your gift. And let's read 2 Corinthians 4, 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. God's concept of ministry is vastly different from man's concept of ministry, from the world's concept of ministry. The world wants a shiny, neat, perfect pass package for ministry. They don't want the glory of God in human weakness. That's why they couldn't accept Christ. That's why they reject Christ now. That's why they crucified Christ, because the glory of God came in human weakness. That's not what the world expects. But if there's one thing that we need to learn, it's that God's will to be glorified in all things determines how we do all things. Let me say that again, because I really want you to get that. God's will to be glorified in all things determines how we do all things. God's purpose is to be glorified. That's what God wants, because He's God. He wants to be glorified. He wants people to see that the power of our gifts belongs to Him, and He does it by putting the treasure of His gifts in weak, broken, earthen vessels like you and me. In the kingdom of God, our weakness, our ordinariness, is not a liability. It's an asset if we truly desire God to be glorified. There is nobody who is too weak, too common, too shy, too inarticulate, or too disabled to do what God has called them to do with the gifts that he has given them. Because it's God who does it through you. By the power of his spirit. So no matter what condition you are in, you have been given a unique gift by God and the humble use of it in reliance on the Spirit will bring glory to God. In our weakness, He is made strong. Number four, the use of your gift causes thankfulness to God to increase. 2 Corinthians 4, 15. For all things are for your sakes, so that the grace of which is spreading to more and more people, may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. Paul is a great example of this because he's an apostle. So this very logically works itself out. As he travels around, he's telling more and more people about Jesus who have never heard about Jesus. So when they become Christians or become believers, thanksgiving increases to God. That's a very easy thing to see how that would work itself out. But I believe that that's true for all of us as well. The proper use of our gifts, whether for unbelievers or for believers, will cause thanksgiving to God to increase. As we serve each other in our weakness, and people say, wow, why would you do that for me? Thank you, you've blessed me so much. All you'll be able to say is it's only by the grace of God and by His Spirit working through me that I was able to do this at all. And in doing that, they'll say, thanks be to God. Glory be to God for gifting you that way and working through you as we use our gifts properly. So there's another incentive. Not only do we get to be partakers in what God is doing in this age, live a life in unison with the Spirit, become servants, which makes us great in the kingdom of God, which will cause, in our weakness, thankfulness to increase to God, there's still one more thing that I want to share. And hopefully, after this, you'll be inspired to use your gifts. Whatever suffering, whatever, this is number five, whatever suffering, whatever affliction, whatever inconvenience you use, you experience as you use your gift in the proper way, it is more than worth it. 
2 Corinthians 4, 17. For more momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Paul is not saying in that verse, just wait it out, it's going to get better by and by. If you just wait it out, it's going to get better. That's not what he's saying. Look at Paul's life. I don't think that happened. Um, he's saying something much better, actually. What he's saying is that when we experience affliction, when we ex and I would say that probably here in Canada, it's more inconvenience to use your gift than affliction or suffering, but you never know. When you experience those things, when it is sustained or endured through faith, it produces in us an eternal weight of glory. And what that means is that as we use them and we experience suffering, but through faith we keep believing and keep using our gifts anyways, through faith, believing that God has something better for us, it increases our joy in the glory of God. And it also increases the thankfulness and the God being glorified in us because people see that no matter what, we're going to do what Paul says and press on in spite of everything. To use our gifts for the edification of everyone else around us and to glorify God because we owe it to him because we're obligated to give back to the person who created us. We're obligated to do what he created us to do if God is God and we serve that God. And so, to close, I just want to reiterate that this is not just for pastors and missionaries and people who stand in front of you and give sermons. That's not who it's for. It's for everyone, to each one of us, Every person who calls themselves a Christian, every person who isn't a Christian, has still been created by God and has still been gifted by God, whether they know it or not. But as believers, we have a responsibility to do something about it. But the great thing is that Paul doesn't say we have this treasure in vessels of silver or gold. He doesn't say we have this treasure in perfect, neat packages, where we, or we have this treasure in perfect, strong people who have it all together. No, he says we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And earthen vessels are chipped, easily broken, fragile things that are cracked. And these broken things, they're us. These weak things are us. But God, by the power of his grace, has chosen to put the treasure of his gifts in our, these broken vessels. And what that means practically is that a guy like me ends up standing in Bosnia in a mosque in front of a mom, imam talking about Jesus. And if God can do that with me, I can only imagine what he can do with you. Because God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the wise, or to shame the strong, and the foolish things to shame the wise. And so as you go out this week, I encourage you to earnestly seek God and say, what have you gifted me to do? What have you created me to do? And once you figure that out, run with it. Say, God, now I'm your weak vessel. Take me and use me. Help me to edify the people around you. And then just wait and see what he does. So I'm just going to pray and then... I think you're going to come up and close the service. Okay. God, I thank you that you are God. God, what a humbling thing to think that you have trusted people like me with your truth and with your treasure. God, with gifts. Who am I to use it and to speak your word, God? Father, you are holy and you are God and we owe all that we have to you, God. And I just ask that as we go out, you would awaken a desire in our hearts to just use the gifts you have given us for your glory, God, and that you would reveal to people who don't know what they are, what they are, God. You would show us what you've created us to be, who you've created us to be, God, and then you would, by the power of your spirit, enable us to walk in your ways. Amen.